very good evening to you. I promise this is going to be scintillating and provocative. What <laughs> else? She can fulfill that promise, <laughs> I won't have to. How can it be otherwise when Shashi Tharoor is my guest? <laughs> Um, a renaissance man with interests so wide and repertoire of books so large that if I were to talk about just a few of them, I think it'll exhaust our time. So, uh, but I'm sure you will refer to some of your books in the answers to... Depends on what you ask, Seema. <laughs> ...to give a flavor to our audience. This evening, we're going to discuss the complexities of India, the tensions and harmonies within? Is it India or Bharat? <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure you're familiar with the latest controversy over the name, which itself wraps many paradoxes. But for the ease of doing business this evening, we're going to stick to India. Is that okay? Sure, but I would be very happy to address that controversy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> A totally unnecessary controversy, I might add. So Mark Twain famously described India as the cradle of the human race, the land of dreams and romance, of fabulous wealth and fabulous poverty, of splendor and rags, of palaces and hovels, the country of hundred nations and a hundred tongues. The sole one country under the sun that is endowed with an imperishable interest for alien prince and alien peasant, for the lettered and ignorant, the wise and the fool, rich and poor, and so on. Fast forward to modern times, and we have a rather prosaic version of the same idea in the words of uh, Cambridge economist Joan Robinson, who said, Whatever you can rightly say about India, the opposite is also true. So let's try to unpack some of it. Um, India has grown, uh, shown quite powerfully that uh, how democracy can flourish <coughs> and despite a multitude of languages, religions, ethnicities. After seven decades of a largely successful uh, democratic experience, um, democracy has gone deep into our society. The electoral system is institutionalized, there is peaceful transfer of power, and candidates don't question election results, unlike in some other places that we know of. Um, so there's uh, better representation of marginalized groups, more devolution of power to the village level. Yet, there is a parallel trend these days, a certain erosion of liberal democratic values. One top government official tried to explain um, and tried to justify this by saying um, it, the backsliding as a case of too much democracy and too much federalism too quickly. Now, are these phenomena interlinked? Does one lead to another? Or has democracy not gone deep enough? What would you say? Well, I think it was in the process of going pretty deep. But you know, Seema, I'd be very honest, uh, what the international professional observers of democracy have seen in India recently uh, is what has led the VDEM Institute, the Varieties of Democracy Institute in, in Stockholm to actually declare India an electoral autocracy. That is, it, the elections are free and fair, but how the government conducts itself between elections is a good deal less than democratic. Now, what does that mean? It means there is, unfortunately, pressure on the media, uh, which we've seen repeatedly. Uh, there's uh, an Indian-American editor who lost his job after he ran a hate tracker in a daily newspaper. Uh, there is, uh, I'm afraid, example after example of uh, stories disappearing from websites of major national publications. Uh, yesterday, an NDTV journalist was fired for tweeting about a story that was suppressed. Um, I mean, you've got, you've got issues uh, up and down in the media. The autonomous institutions, which were meant to be the repositories of neutrality and integrity above the political fray, have all been, to a greater or lesser degree, brought to heel by the government of the day. Uh, to the extent that their autonomy has been hollowed out 
their credibility to uphold democratic values is in question. And with all of this going on, we've also seen some fundamental challenges to the basic assumptions of Indian nationhood that people like me grew up with, uh, which is that um, we're seeing the, the othering of a particular minority, the Muslim community, in ways that was unthinkable. I mean, things that would not have been said uh, in private behind closed doors are now being declaimed loudly from political platforms in public. And that sort of thing is, uh, frankly, shame-making and, and is, has led many of us to question whether we are indeed the land that, as a true democracy, offers a home to people of every stripe, every complexion, every language, every religion, and every kind of political opinion. That's what's become worrying. I mean, you've seen think tanks uh, being coming, coming under terrible pressure, civil society organizations losing their tax status, their funding, their right to obtain foreign contributions. All of these things have also undermined the ability of other voices to grow and flourish in our, in our polity. You asked for it, so I'm giving you a very candid answer. Um, we, we're going around talking of ourselves as the mother of democracy, um, which is a claim others can also make, the Greeks in particular. But uh, I don't think there are too many mothers who would treat their children this way. True. <laughs> so let's look at politics for a minute. Um, on the one hand, since you are a politician, I think we need to talk about politics also. On the one hand, there is a commitment by all political parties to sort of reduce the pernicious effects of the caste system. Yet, come election time, and parties will choose candidates uh, based mostly on caste calculations. Uh, finding the right candidate from the right caste has become a delicate and fine art. You've been uh, in politics long enough. How do you look at this massive contradiction? Oh, there's been an amazing uh, change from the assumptions about caste in our country. In the 1950s, I think it's fair to say that people like Jawaharlal Nehru uh, assumed caste would simply disappear. Dr. Ambedkar could write and speak of the annihilation uh, of caste as a practice. Uh, Today, we are very far from all of that because what's happened is indeed that political parties discovered that caste could be mobilized as an instrument uh, uh, of political uh, loyalty and political support. And as a result of anything, the Indian electorate and the Indian public are more conscious of caste than ever. We've also had the expansion of the reservation facility initially written into the Constitution for 10 years and only for the scheduled castes and tribes, the, the former Dalits and the Aboriginal people of India, the Adivasis. Uh, they had reservations. Initially, for, reservations, by the way, for the Americans here are quotas, guaranteeing places in government jobs, in parliament, in, in universities, in medical colleges, and so on, uh, to members of those communities. So that's been extended indefinitely. But in 1989-90, you had the addition of reservations for the so-called other backward classes, which are, in fact, okay. uh, intermediate castes by caste name. And the result now is that there's a tremendously solid vested interest in all of this, which means that far from caste disappearing, uh, political parties are now calling for a caste census. They say, since our privileges and rights are being encoded through caste, Let's know exactly how many of us there are. And, and for many, this is a potentially explosive issue. So it'll it might... never go away, you think? It doesn't look like it. I remember, I remember saying to uh, an American friend, you all of you live in New York and you know the subway system and the, the third rail. Well, talking about getting rid of caste from Indian politics, it would be the third rail of Indian politics. Touch it and you get electrified, electrocuted instantly. So uh, everyone, frankly, sits around accepting that this is part of the idiom now. There will be appeals to voters on the basis of caste. As you said, you know, uh, uh, candidates will be identified based on how much support their caste might mobilize for them. You also have um, <laughs> the, the, the cliche now that uh, when you cast your vote, you vote your caste. <laughs> right. But that, is, that isn't totally accurate because obviously no caste functions as a monolith and individuals of of a certain caste affiliation could still have other political preferences, but it becomes a very significant factor. 
And of course, you might have an election in which two people of the same caste, right. but representing different parties, are competing against each other. And then caste alone is not enough, but it simply is, is a And it's showing up here in the United States as well, uh, problems of caste. Like, you know, well, yeah, I know that's become a major controversy now. And I think yeah. <coughs> the idea that you should not discriminate against people on the basis of anything, including caste, is to me unexceptionable. But I think some have seen the use of caste in anti-discrimination legislation as actually a way of, uh, of, of uh, discriminating against the Hindu community. And that's got to be resolved, I think, within the Indian American community before it's settled and take, uh, before it's taken out into the, into the wider community. Mm -hmm. but, but discrimination of any sort is wrong, and in the Indian constitution says the same thing. Uh, so recognizing, for example, people of the former untouchable caste for the purposes of positive affirmative action uh, is fine. We have the world's oldest and farthest reaching affirmative action program. Um, but discriminating against them is unconstitutional. So mm -hmm. you can actually draw a line between identifying a caste identity and, and, uh, and at the same time using it negatively against people. But it's not an easy minefield to navigate. And, and I agree with you that certainly that would be one of the, the paradoxes we're sort of thrusting madly forward into the 21st century but we are still uh, very mired uh, socially in a 2,000-year-old institution. Right. Um, now, let's uh, look at the economic picture. India has some of the richest and some of the poorest people yeah. uh, living within eyesight of each other. Uh, the disparity is stark. India has become one of the most unequal countries in the world. Um, just 5% of Indians own about 60% of the country's wealth, according to Oxfam, and more than 40% of the wealth created from 2012 to 2021 went to 1% of the population. And only 3% of the wealth trickled down to about 50% at right. the bottom. Uh, the combined wealth of India's 100 richest has touched a staggering $660 billion. Uh, this is perhaps the most troubling of all paradoxes, at least to me. Um, the surprising thing is not how violent India is, but how peaceful, given the inequalities. I mean, what's going on? <laughs> I mean, you're totally right in all the facts you've cited. I can add to those. In fact, uh, I believe the wealth of the four richest Indians combined exceeds that of the majority of member states of the United Nations. Uh, because uh, uh, the, the combined GDP is of a majority of member states of the United Nations. Uh, and of course, while we have more dollar billionaires than any country in Asia, including China and including Japan, which has been richer for longer, mm -hmm. uh, nonetheless, uh, we have more people living below the poverty line than both Japan and China combined. Uh, so we've got these paradoxes, you, you mentioned figures for inequality. Um, why is it all peaceful? Well, I think partially, of course, the electoral democracy aspect does help, because you have a, a periodic uh, sort of valve to let off pressure on the pressure cooker, and that's a very useful role that democracy can always play, is that if people are, are, have reason to be unhappy and they want to seek change, they can vote for it. They don't have to pick up guns to fight for it. Mm -hmm. And that's always a a worthwhile thing. But I was thinking as you were reading that Mark Twain quote, how little of those paradoxes have actually changed in a hundred years. Right. Um, I mean, everything you've said, I'm afraid, still remains true, and we can add to a few more. I mean, uh, the fact that we are shooting rockets off into space while a lot of people are still trundling around in bullock carts, that we have some of the world's leading uh, software uh, engineers and, and, and technologists uh, in, in, in the cutting edge fields that Silicon Valley is famous for. Mm -hmm. uh, and we also have farmers who are using agricultural techniques that haven't changed much in a thousand years mm -hmm. uh, with the kind of implements and, 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 and animals and carts and so on that they would have used a thousand years ago. That's still going on. So we've got all of, the, all of these paradoxes that we can talk about. Um, uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's um, what can I say? It's, it's a situation that is not easy always to explain. Uh, but partially we have learned, I think, over the years to live 
with various contradictions. In fact, I mean, it's often amusing that, um, that you know, if you walked on an Indian street, you'd think everybody's in a hurry, and yet no one ever seems to be on time, right? I mean, that's, <laughs> that's also part of the paradoxes of India, uh, where uh, um, an uncle of mine could bitterly remark, you know, in this country, you can't go forward unless you're a backward. Um, and in fact, you know, uh, there's, the, there's the opposite as well, as we, we've talked about in our earlier question. Um, there is, frankly, uh, a real challenge uh, when it comes to when it comes to the the, the questions that you've you've tried to talk about. But we can also uh, talk about our society and the paradoxes. Um, somebody once said, and I'm sure you can bleep this out when I quote it, but India is the only country in the world where you can piss in public but can't kiss in public, and that's also <laughs> part of us, part of the paradoxes of our society, um, and. As a woman pointed out, ours is the only country where it's dangerous to talk to strangers, but okay to marry one. <laughs> so, so, so when you talked about the paradoxes of India, I mean, we live with all of these contradictions, and that's just some more of them. So is it something in our DNA that allows us to live kind of somewhat comfortably what is it? Is it our religion? Is it like Hindus think a different way? What is it? Yeah, but this Hindus think a different way, I think, can be taken too far. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've always been a bit skeptical about Hindu fatalism because Hindus go to temples and pray for their kids to ace the exams and get a good job and all of and those things And they also go well. to church and yeah, sometimes, Yeah, and, and, and churches know? and masjids and gurudwaras and everything. Yes. What I'm saying is that people want the same things everywhere. I don't really think that we are... If you're born a Hindu, you just accept your fate. So you work as hard as you can. We're a very competitive society, as you know, particularly when it comes to things like examinations and so on. Right. Um, uh, as I think Mr. Naranamurthy famously pointed out in a 60 Minutes interview, um, Harvard has an acceptance rate of 10%. The IITs have an acceptance rate of 0.001%. Right. So, I mean, you know, uh, we, we, we have a, an intensely competitive society. People are striving. People are working hard. Uh, I wouldn't say that... that uh, you know, Hindus think that way, but, but we do have paradoxes. I mean, Hindus worship goddesses all over the country and, and yet seem to despise having daughters. Um, they, 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 uh, there's the built-in societal preference for a son every time, and the way in which daughters are often mistreated as they're brought up uh, is startling in a, in a country where, uh, we, we, you know, the, the worship of the goddess in her various forms uh, is so um, widespread. So that's a contradiction. Don't we see that? Right. We don't, apparently. Yes. OK, moving on. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I knew I was crossing some lines. Somewhere. <laughs> uh, so uh, we look at India's foreign policy for a minute. Uh, there again, you notice the contradictions right from the early days. Uh, India was non-aligned during, uh, but during the Cold War, uh, it was able to maintain a working relationship with both the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, today, it's a member of the Quad, or the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, which is made up of the US, Japan, Australia, and India. It's also a member of I2U2, which is um, Israel, US, India, and the United Arab Emirates. Both groups are attempts to create a favorable balance of power. Um, on the other hand, India has this uh, old friendship with Russia and is buying oil like there's no tomorrow. So um, I know the foreign minister has tried to explain it uh, as India has to look after its people, its economy, its national interests. Yet in the West, there is a lot of uh, difficulty with that position. Uh, Not really. <laughs> I was coming to that. I was yeah. coming to that. We just had a G20 summit right. where President Biden seemed to have, and the West in general, had seemed to have climbed down a bit from their position. So uh, this brings me to, uh, like, how has India managed to straddle the middle to walk on this tightrope, um, has it managed to educate the big powers uh, on how to live with contradictions? Is it deft diplomacy? 
I mean, why are major powers willing to accommodate India? Okay, well, uh, there's a lot of, lot of things yes. in what you said that need to be unpacked. First, on the question of non-alignment and so on, I, as far back as my last years in the UN, I started talking about the world moving away from notions of non-alignment to those of multi-alignment. And I'm very pleased that, though I floated that when I was a minister in the government, uh, and it didn't quite catch on at the time, <laughs> uh, subsequently, it does seem to have begun to come into vogue, and Foreign Minister Jayashankar is using that word, and, and the first time he did so, he attributed it to me, so I'm full, very oh. happy to take credit for it. What I meant Good by that is... Good for him that he attributed, remembered to attribute it to That's you. right, but, but let, let, me, let me explain what I meant and, and why I think it's exactly what's happening. We've moved away from the binary world of the Cold War era. We are in a world that is really much more like the World Wide Web, this networked world in which, you know, I'm connected to you, uh, and then you're connected to him, but I'm not necessarily connected to him unless uh, there's some other issues in which we need to be connected. We all have these multiple connections all over the place, and that, in a very simple way, uh, gives us a world where multi multiple alignments are possible. Now, in India's case, for example, the paradoxes that Seema was hinting at include not just the one she's mentioned, but also, for example, the fact that we were a leading voice in the G77, which is sort of the global trade union of developing countries, as well as a key player in the G20, which is the management, as it were, of the world macroeconomy, that we were a, a loud voice in the non-aligned movement uh, railing against the colonial oppressors of the Western world. And now, uh, 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 at the same time as we were doing that, we were also a loud voice in the community of democracies alongside the very Western countries that uh, we were criticizing the non-aligned movement. Uh, we've been fighting for some years now a permanent seat on the Security Council, but at the same time, we have a, an understandable focus on our immediate neighborhood with all the dangers and challenges that represent. So these paradoxes are widespread. And if you look at the way in which we've been trying to navigate this multi-aligned world, our foreign minister meets every year with his counterparts from Russia and China in something called RIC. Then he adds the Brazilians and South Africans to it, and he gets BRICS. Then he you know, takes out the, the Russians and the Chinese, and he, and he gets uh, IBSA, Ipsa for South-South yes. cooperation. And to that, he adds China, but not Russia, and he gets BASIC for environmental negotiations. And these are all formulae in which formulations in which India has a vital role to play, not merely because its name so conveniently begins with that indispensable element in every, in every acronym, a vowel, uh, <laughs> at, least, at least until today, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but also because, obviously, India has something to contribute to each of these groups and has something to gain from each of them. So that's the kind of multi-alignment that I see taking place in the world. And in that, yes, we do uh, live with a lot of contradictions. Now, on your specific example of Russia, Ukraine, oil, and so on, frankly, I think the West, after their initial protestations, very quickly accepted what was going on mm -hmm. for two reasons. I mean, the assumption always was that the West was tolerating this because... India was indispensable in the larger, bigger picture against, as a counterweight against China, but it's much more than that. Uh, there are economic reasons as well. India buys a dramatically larger quantity of uh, Russian oil and gas, but as a result, it keeps global oil prices stable. Because if India wasn't a customer for all of this Russian oil and gas, and that was taken off the market, if right. sanctions were upheld everywhere, the remaining oil would have more people, including India, demanding for it, and the prices would go up. So all of us would be paying more at the pump, even in New York, if India wasn't buying Russian oil. That's one very important consideration which the West has realized. The second thing so people don't realize, West... wait, is that all this comes into India is then refined in process in India. Right. And you know who's been buying all the increased refined output? The Europe. US and the UK. Forget the Europeans, the US too. So the fact is that uh, the fact is that there are contradictions also in the way in which the world has been reacting mm -hmm. to all of this. But in many ways in diplomacy, it is considered a virtue to be acceptable to both sides of an equation. If you can talk mm -hmm. to, to both people, I, I, I certainly feel that at, at the appropriate time, India should leverage its, its decent relations with both sides to try and promote peace in this conflict. At the moment, I'm not sure the time, the situation is ripe for peace right now, um, mm -hmm. but certainly India would be in a position to make more of a difference as mm -hmm. a peacemaker precisely because it hasn't burnt its bridges with either side. That's right. the only good thing. I was 
a bit of a heretic in the Indian political space as the one Indian parliamentarian, in fact, the only one in the debates in parliament on Ukraine, who criticized the government's policy, and particularly its somewhat mealy-mouthed articulation of its policy initially at the UN. The articulation has improved considerably since then. Uh, uh, and, and I had justified my reasons in an article in Foreign Affairs magazine uh, about a year ago. So there's, there's a lot there that, that I don't fully subscribe to, but I've understood why a year later the policy still holds good and why it's broadly consensual within India. Uh, it just needs to be put across in a way that's perhaps less uh, belligerent or hostile to other countries and much more willing right. to accommodate uh, everyone's concerns and point of view on this. I think I would add to that that uh, the way the world has changed, especially uh, geopolitically, that the West no longer dismisses uh, a country like India and the you know, global South anymore like it once used to. You know, uh, the Americans used to just dismiss India as, uh, oh, you're in the Soviet camp and you have nothing to add except to complain your giant headache in, you know, <laughs> in our head <laughs> and just go away somehow. Pakistan is so much better, easier, etc. But today, I see a real dramatic change. The West is actually listening to how India is articulating uh, the you know needs and compulsions of the global south, which the war has exacerbated. Absolutely. In fact, the war has affected countries far, far away. Many African countries have had uh, a crisis when it comes to the uh, rise in commodity prices, the difficulty of obtaining enough wheat, uh, mm -hmm. because Ukraine and Russia put together used to account for 40% of the world's uh, grain exports and wheat mm -hmm. exports in particular. And given all of that, many, many countries have suffered. There, there's a food crisis. There's also a debt crisis in many developing countries. Right. So all of this undoubtedly, Seema, uh, you know, is, is, is definitely exacerbated by the war. Um, one could talk about a number of other aspects of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of India's foreign policy as embodying paradoxes, but I would say that, broadly speaking, um, what's interesting is that this has been effectively leveraged uh, into what the government is able to portray uh, to its voting public as a success story, most recently at the G20. So um, we'll have to wait and see how that all plays out. But on the global level, I don't see much public criticism anymore of right. India's stances and all this. Ukraine was not happy, I understand, with the de daily declaration. Uh, but they will probably end up swallowing their disappointment because the rest of the countries that went along with the declaration right. Uh, account for an enormously right. large uh, percentage of their own support base as well in Ukraine. Right. I mean, they'll have to swallow this one because uh, the G7, Europe, the, um, America, they join hands mainly because they wanted this G20 presidency to be successful. And because if India had not produced a communique, a joint declaration, that would have been uh, India's failure and that would have meant another country's uh, victory. We shall not name that country, but uh, you know what I mean. You didn't mention anything about your books in any of the answers. Look at that, how modest I've been. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> <coughs> well, one person I mentioned in one of my answers, Dr. Ambedkar, was the subject of my last book published in the US, which was uh, brought out by Manchester University Press, The Life of uh, Dr. Ambedkar and his... Uh, his extraordinary contributions as somebody coming from the Dalit community and, and at the same time being sort of India's James Madison as the chairman of the drafting committee of the Indian Constitution. His legacy is what that's all about. Uh, it's, it's striking many Americans don't realize this, but Dr. Ambedkar today uh, has become perhaps the, the only figure I can think of in Indian contemporary politics who has grown in stature since his death. He died 67 years ago as a fairly controversial figure who'd lost more elections than he'd won. And today he is, he is literally, you can put a halo around him because uh, right. he is unchallengeable. Every party tries to lay claim to his legacy. Um, and it's quite striking when you, when you think about how much, there's another paradox, if you like, of, of mm -hmm. how much he has grown in stature. There was a poll that two television channels conducted about 10 years ago for the greatest Indian of the 20th century. And none of the names that you might predict, you know, Gandhi, Nehru, etc., uh, uh, 
made it. It was Dr. Ambedkar who was elected uh, in, a, in a poll in which 20 million Indians voted. So there, there's something there, and there's probably more statues of him uh, in India than that of any other Indian, with the possible exception of Mahatma Gandhi, but somebody has to go and do a, a statue census to confirm that. Mm -hmm. But certainly every village, every street corner, I mean, not, not every street corner, but every neighborhood and every city will have a bust at least of Dr. Ambedkar somewhere, mm -hmm. if not a full-fledged statue of him standing in his three-piece suit with a constitution in his hand. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's been quite striking as well. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about Bharat versus India? I'm happy yes, to... <laughs> yes. Uh... No, I mean, I think, I think, first of all, the controversy is totally unnecessary because the Constitution actually resolved this issue. The Constituent Assembly debated it because the nativists wanted Bharat and the, the, uh, uh, the sort of more dominant voices led by Nehru wanted to preserve India. So they settled on a perfect compromise. The, 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 the uh, Constitution speaks of India, that is Bharat. So both names are equally valid. Uh, and... There's Article 52 that says there shall be a president of India. And the Hindi version says uh, Bharat ke Rashtrapati, that is the president of India in Hindi. And many Indian languages use a Bharat or a form of Bharat, um, a Bharatam and so on as, as the name for the country. So it was actually working perfectly well. And I think one of the great things that Nehru understood, were two of the great things that he understood at that time, was that by remaining India... <coughs> India established itself as a successor state to the British Raj in India, mm -hmm. uh, from which Pakistan was seceding. Right. If we had adopted the name Bharat and Pakistan had been Pakistan, then India would have been the name for the collective subcontinent, but no longer for any one country. Right. And even legally, that would have been problematic. Uh, secondly, there is the undoubted fact that, um, that India is a name that's been around for a very long time and that uh, is redolent with history and with various associations. Uh, the defenders of this proposed change in the, in the ruling party say that India was imposed on us by British colonialism and it's part of our colonized mindsets we need to get rid of. I'm sorry to say that it's completely wrong. Uh, the name India exists for a couple of thousand years. Yes. Uh, way, you know, when the British were still running around in skins, uh, far from colonizing any of us. Uh, and if you go back to, um, you know, 2,000 years ago to the writings of Herodotus, Megasthenes, the Greek historians, they spoke of India. The idea is that the, the river Sindhu, or Indus, uh, uh, was the, the defining element. What lay beyond was India. And interestingly enough, uh, the Persians couldn't pronounce the, the S. The so S. the Sindhu, the people beyond the Sindhu, they wanted to call them by some name, so they said they're the Hindus. Yeah. Now, if you start abolishing the name India, you'll have to start abolishing the term Hindu as well. Yeah. And no longer will the BJP be able to announce, you know, say with pride that you are Hindu, because <laughs> that's exactly the same etymology as saying, say with pride that I'm Indian, which I do, and we've all been doing for 75 years. Well, I think the idea is, because I was listening to the foreign minister explain it in one of the TV interviews, the idea is just to introduce Bharat more prominently in the national discourse. He was saying that many countries have two names, right? Uh, Germany ja and Deutschland. Yeah. But Japan. it's Germany in English and internationally, and it's Deutschland in Germany. So within, within I think Germany. what he was hinting at is that, like, the Japanese call uh, their country Nippon, and um, so we'll call our country Bharat, but for outside purposes, for the rest of the world, it'll remain India. Because if you change India to Bharat officially in the UN, uh, the Pakistanis will lay claim to the name. <laughs> they could. That will be the biggest irony of it all, <laughs> you know. So, uh, who knows? I think it's mainly... No, but in that case, the entire thing is completely pointless because we already have the right to use both names. They're introducing it into the public discourse. I think that's how I read it. Uh, I don't know, but I could be wrong. <laughs> So, it's just the, the mix-up, you know, the, Mr. Modi sitting behind a nameplate at the G20 that said Bharat in Roman letters, uh -huh. which frankly made no sense because... Uh, and, or the president issuing her official invitations as the president of Bharat. I mean, that's actually a contradiction of Article 52 of the Constitution. She's the president of India, or right. if she wants to write her invitation card in Hindi, she's the Rashtrapati of Bharat. But oh, she fine. can't possibly uh, mix the two up. It, it really doesn't make any, any sense, and that's... 
That's the flaw in this uh, right. nativist assertion of, of a Bharat. Uh, but you know, the BJP is pretty good at mixing things up. The it is a weapon of mass distraction, I have to tell you. <laughs> you know, they, they love coming up with these controversies that take us away from the real problems facing the country today. A few months right. before a general election, where the issues I mean, of unemployment and, and, and... Look and at the G20. The, oh, yeah. The symbol was the lotus, which happens to also be... The that of the ruling party, yeah. And yes. In fact, Mr. Modi's picture, some journalists calculated, occurred every 50 metres in every corner of India. <coughs> I'm sorry, every corner of the capital, Delhi. Every 50 metres, you could see Mr. Modi's picture as part of the G20 promotion. Do you know that we spent 10 times more than the Germans did to, yes. to, uh, to, to run our G20. Uh, and, you know, we have, what, one-seventh the per capita income of Germany. So it, it really seems a bit, uh, it seems a bit uh, extravagant, but it, again, is being weaponized as publicity for the ruling party. And I'm sure the Cricket World Cup, where all the key matches are taking place in the Narendra Modi Stadium, will also be an instrument of ruling party publicity. I mean, that's the way it works. Um, but, you know, we're, we're going to see how effective all this is when the voters actually cast their ballots. Right. But, uh, I mean, to be fair, uh, they did manage to push India's foreign policy forward in s many, many areas. I mean, I know it was weaponized as, a, you know, as if nobody else ever had the presidency of G20. It's India's the first country to do so. But um, they did manage it well. I'll have to, uh, you know, acknowledge that. Would you? Yeah, no, no, I did. I, I, have, I have acknowledged the fact that, particularly pulling off the agreed declaration, which many people thought would not be possible, was, was a yes. very, very successful uh, act of, of adroit diplomacy. I think you're getting the signal that it's time for you to open up to the audience here. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, questions, please. Okay, a gentleman right there in a Nehru jacket. My God, your Modi jacket. Is than mine. Modi jacket, sorry. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Hello, my name is Sohail. I think what you might need really is a flak jacket more than anything else, but anyway. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, thank you so much for your words and your incisiveness dealing with these murky topics that we're all trying to parse. Uh, my name is Sohail. I'm from Kerala. Nope. And my question is about uh, another paradox, the paradox of Kerala. Kerala recently has been subject of a lot of attacks and criticism from uh, certain quarters of Indian political discourse. Now. How, man, how much of that criticism do you think is warranted and people from Kerala, you and myself, should take seriously? And how much of that do you think is completely unwarranted? And if at all, are there any lessons that maybe Kerala can teach? Well, you know, it's a, it depends on the point of view uh, um, that the critic is coming from. So, for example, um, you know, if, if, you, if you look at those who sort of denounce the place as a, as a, as a hotbed of communism... Um, Literally, they're right. It's the only state in India ruled by the Communist Party, and the communists have won re-election. Uh, but um, if you look at what they actually practice, there isn't a, you know, a communist practice in their, in their entire repertoire. So um, what are we talking about? This is a party that stuck to an old label, but which is very much moved with the times and is, is, is extremely uh, in bed with, with, the, with the capitalist classes, as it were. Um, so that's again a question. There is the other criticism that uh, Kerala is a place where you can't do business because um, because um, we have the most advanced labor rights in the country, and of course we also have the most hyperactive unions who will show up with red flags the moment you try and start a factory and so on. Now there, there is some justice in that criticism because I've actually spent some time trying to promote investments in Kerala. Uh, and a heck of a lot of uh, investors, including people like you of Malayali origin living abroad, uh, have refused to invest in Kerala because they don't believe their investments would be safe. And that's something I believe desperately needs changing because what I'm seeing today is young people like you leaving the state in very large numbers. They can't wait to graduate and get out of there because they feel their prospects for jobs, for advancement, uh, are, are so much more limited in Kerala. I remember a young man, when I asked him so why he felt he needed to, to, to go outside the state, he said, what's there for me here? Isn't it a retirement home? Isn't Kerala an old age home, is what he actually said. Uh, and that, that kind of concern is real. I believe all criticism should be taken seriously. Look, look, at, look behind it to understand 
what exactly people are saying and see whether the, some of it can be, can be addressed. I mean, the great Kerala model we've all talked about sometimes does rest on, on, um, on, on some illusions. For example, we have the, the country's highest literacy rate. That's not illusory. That goes back a couple of hundred years of practice in, in Kerala. Uh, we have a very well-organized civil society and a lot of excellent uh, community responses and so on and so forth, all of which works very well. But it's also true that as you look at the way in which um, Kerala has grown up and developed, uh, there are a number of things that are sustained entirely by remittances from us having exported our unemployment. Our people have gone off and worked in the Gulf, have worked in other cities in India, sent money home, and that's what sustained this uh, high ranking in the Human Development Index. The day those countries decide they don't need Keralites anymore uh, or, or expatriate labor anymore, we would be in very, very serious trouble. And we should actually take this window to try and create the institutions and practices that would make Kerala viable, even if tomorrow all our expatriates had to come back. Okay, um, the lady there uh, on the left, please. <coughs> Thank you. My name is Banju Kak. Um, I come from Delhi. My question is that it is well known that the centrist approach of the Congress party, which Patel symbolized, had its roots in a, a very Hindu consciousness. Somewhere along the line, the Congress party abandoned that for vote bank politics. That was obviously uh, harnessed by the current dispensation through a genuine sense of grievance of the aspirational, what you call people who occupy Bharat and not India. Why has your party not been able to harness that, considering it is important and topical, and relegated that political space only to the domination of the RSS? Is there any genuine political reason, I'm not talking about the philosophical reason, but any genuine political reason for that? Well, I mean, you are asking in a sense the wrong person, because I actually have written a book called Why I'm a Hindu, which is available in the US. And, and Seema has been accusing me of not publicizing my own books enough. Let me flag this one to you. It actually explains um, my Hinduism, and I believe the Hinduism of the vast majority of people who've grown up in the Hindu faith in India. Uh, but I think it's also uh, because of my political conviction that you can't win the argument with Hindutva from a purely secular standpoint, that you really do have to enter into the discourse, as I have done, to argue that Hindutva is a distortion of real Hinduism. And the Hinduism of Swami Vivekananda and others that I have tried to articulate and that most Hindus have grown up with is actually a very inclusive Hinduism and not the Hinduism... Uh, that these chaps practice, which has reduced the soaring majesty of the faith into something akin to the hooligan, the, the, the sort of uh, the, the, the petty parochialism of the British football hooligan, you who know, goes on saying, if you don't support my team, I'm going to bang you on the head with my placard. I mean, that, that's not Hinduism, but that's what the Hindutva movement has reduced it to. Uh, now, going back to your question of why has the Congress not stuck to that, it's partially because secularism had become an article of faith. I, I, I don't accept the notion of vote bank politics being an exclusively Congress uh, failing because every party was, was playing this game. As Seema mentioned, some were appealing to certain castes, some were appealing to certain linguistic groups, some to certain religious groups, and some um, uh, were, were trying to see if they could construct coalitions of different interests. And perhaps it's not entirely wrong to say that uh, in some... Uh, at some stage, Congress politicians may have thought it useful to appeal to Muslim votes by a appeasing, quote-unquote, a word I don't like either, uh, the most sort of uh, conservative elements in those communities and telling them that they would be safe as long as they voted for the Congress. Be that as it may, obviously that's the shelf life of that approach is, has ended with the elections of 2014, if not even earlier. By the 90s already, you saw a significant shift in the, in the voting pattern. I think what the Congress is now trying to do, rightly in my view, <coughs> is to move the debate beyond Hinduism and its practice, since 80% of the population is Hindu anyway, into the issues that matter to all people, whether you're Hindu or not. 
the fact that you don't have jobs right now, that we have the highest recorded rate of unemployment ever since figures began to be kept. The fact that, that um, uh, in India, which is a low-tolerance country when it comes to inflation, uh, we have a pretty high inflation rate. That means that most people are no longer able to afford uh, the, the, the regular uh, purchases that they went to the marketplace for, even, even fruit and vegetables. So all of these issues, which cut across into sort of the, I mean, what the West would call bread and butter issues for people, those are the issues on which we want to run, rather than enter into sterile debates about uh, faith, about whether we are appeasing one group or another group, whatever else. Everybody at the end of the day needs to eat, needs to live, needs a job, needs a chance to thrive. And we will, of course, insist that that should be irrespective of their religious origin. So uh, the Congress's attitude is very much that, yes, every Muslim should feel safe with the Congress, but so too should every Hindu. Uh, as far as we are concerned, we would like to remain the party of all Indians as we were during the freedom struggle. Okay, we'll go to this side of the auditorium. There's a gentleman. Uh, Last question. Right for me. <coughs> Hi. Good evening, Mr. Thurur for coming to New York and uh, giving me the opportunity to, to at least see you face to face. Uh, my name is Punit. I live in New York, <coughs> probably connected to India a lot more than I need to be. So I'd like to address that unnecessary controversy of Bharat that you pointed out correctly. Uh, well, there's a method to the madness, in my opinion at least. <laughs> Since the coalition left the name UPA and started INDIA, India, the psyche behind every Indian would be to vote for India. And if I'm not mistaken, what BJP is doing is what every other party would do at the same time, which is use the terminology that is already in there to hit subliminally and work around it. So how is it so controversial? I mean, to me, it's not. No, it wouldn't be if they, if they were doing it uh, in Indian languages. I speak of Bharat all the time when I make my speeches in Kerala and Malayalam. And it's sure the same logic applies in Hindi. It's this, this, this deliberate sort of mixing up by using Bharat, where the word India used to be used, that, that creates this problem. Actually, I did mischievously suggest that if their problem was with the opposition alliance calling itself India, then we could call ourselves uh, the alliance for betterment, harmony, and the... Uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> sort of reconstruction of a better tomorrow or whatever, that would give us Bharat at the end, uh, a reconstruction, uh, sorry, the, uh, and the revival of advancement for tomorrow or responsible advancement for tomorrow. And you get Bharat and then we can have both Bharat and India as, as our acronyms in English and then we'll see whether the BJP will change the name of the country one more time. I mean, you know, it, it becomes a bit fatuous, doesn't it, to get into this game? I think we were doing perfectly well for 75 years using India in English and Bharat in Indian languages. And I think we should continue doing that. Uh, the fact that we call ourselves India in every language as an opposition alliance, even though the term is originally in, uh, in English, is, is merely a, a happenstance. It's going to last six or eight or nine months. Uh, after all, uh, Mr. Modi, as the prime minister of India, has many, many slogans using the word India, including digital India, make in India, start up India, stand up India, <laughs> sit down India. I mean, sit down India. Got the whole lot. So, I'm not sure it's going to make that much of a difference at the end of the day, uh, but I suspect this, this bubble too will burst before too long and we'll move on to grapple with the real issues facing the country. Do you think the name of the Alliance India got the BJP's goat a little bit? It seems to have, uh, it seems to have got under their skin because, you know, the same Prime Minister who used so many slogans with India in it started yeah. comparing the opposition alliance to the Indian Mujahideen and, and other sort of terrorist groups. Uh, that used India in their names, which frankly uh, seemed a bit over the top, wouldn't yeah. you say? I would, yeah. <coughs> that, that was a little much. <laughs> okay, any more questions? We're not oh. going to allow any okay. more questions, except if you're signing the book. Are you, are you able to sign books? 
If you have books, we I'm have. Happy. So you have ten minutes to to run upstairs to the bookstore and buy the last few books that we may have. We have several of your books that have Glad been to mentioned you. tonight, and uh, and I highly encourage you to immediately go. Well, wait, not not immediately. First, let's thank our incredible speaker. Thank you.